I am going to read the first six verses in the 11th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. The first six verses in the 11th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, we resume, in other words, our study of this um, first uh, section of uh, this great argument which the mighty apostle uh, opens out in this 11th chapter of the epistle to the Romans. The first section runs from verse 1 to verse 10. But uh, we have uh, subdivided that also into three sections. The first uh, consisting of the first verse and the first half of the second verse. Then the second uh, running from the second half of verse 2 to the end of verse 6. And then uh, the third portion of this first section from verse 7 to verse 10. In other words, what the apostle is dealing with is this. In this first section, verses 1 to 10, he is uh, pointing out that uh, the rejection of the nation of Israel is not total. It appeared, looking at the church, that God had finished with the nation of Israel as a nation and as a people, and that that meant that he had done so in a full and in a complete manner, that God had altogether finished with the Jews, with the children of Israel. Now the apostle is dealing with that uh, idea, which obviously must have been current, otherwise the great apostle would never have troubled to deal with it in this way. And having put his question, hath God cast away his people? He answers it immediately, remember, by being aghast at the very idea, God forbid as it's translated here. It's unthinkable. Let it not so much as be <coughs> mentioned even as a possibility. And then he proceeds to give us uh, his reasons for that. Now, we dealt last week with the first reason. And his first argument is, I myself also am an Israelite. I'm of the seed of Abram of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, I'm alone enough. If God has entirely finished with his people, well then how am I a Christian? How am I a member of the Christian church? Why am I saved? So he says, the fact that I'm in it and am an apostle is in and of itself proof sufficient that God has not entirely finished with his people. And then he goes on, of course, to underline that and to reinforce it by saying, God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now, in many ways, that is the key uh, to the whole of this chapter. That's why we spent so much time with it last week. Because the whole argument is going to be based upon this election of God. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. And that foreknew, you remember, doesn't just mean that he was aware of their existence or of knowledge of them, but he has known them in a very special sense. They, of all the people of the earth, had he known under the Old Testament dispensation. The nations, all the other nations, were outside the knowledge of God, and God had known only this peculiar people, this people whom he had made as a possession for himself. Very well, there's the first argument. Now then, we can move on to the second argument, which, as I say, runs from the second half of the second verse to verse 6. Now, here again, uh, we can subdivide the matter. 
It's an obvious and a very natural uh, division. The Apostle, first of all, states a case. And he does that from the second half of verse 2 to the end of verse 4. And then in verses 5 and 6, he applies it. Shows the relevance of what he's saying. And uh, this is the thing, that I say, that we now have got to consider. Now, first of all, let us just deal with pure exposition in order that we may get our facts uh, right and then we can proceed to draw certain lessons for ourselves from what the Apostle is saying. He introduces this matter by saying, What ye not? Do you not know? Are you not aware of the fact? Are you ignorant of the Scriptures? Now, here again, we must turn aside to point out how the great Apostle always does the thing that he's doing here. He's putting it to, to their knowledge, to their reason. Don't you know what the scriptures say, he says? Now, why does he do that? Well, he's anxious to show them that this is not his idea. It's not some theory that he's got. The Apostle never bases his ultimate position upon that. He, he always wants them to see and to know that what he's saying is based upon the authority of the word of God. This isn't some novel idea, he's saying. And that again is the most important point. There's nothing new, he says, in all this. You may be amazed at that, but he says there isn't. There's nothing new at all about it. This kind of thing has happened many times before. And he picks out one notable and striking illustration of this very thing. In other words, as we have seen so often in his reasoning and argumentation, a point that he makes perhaps more frequently than any other in these three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, is just this, that there is nothing new in what is happening, that repeatedly in the Old Testament, in the long story of the children of Israel, the self-same situation had obtained. Now, that's a very important argument. Because the charge that was leveled against the great apostle was this. That in preaching the gospel and in the, and in the whole notion of the Christian church. That he was bringing in an element of division. That he was saying that all that had gone in the past was of no value. And that this new teaching was something absolutely new. Which you couldn't in any way link on to or reconcile with the teaching of the Old Testament. Nothing is so important to the great apostle as to be able to show that there's nothing new here in principle. Nothing new in principle. It had all been foretold. God has only got one great method. You get it in the Old Testament as well as the New. There's only one way of salvation. You see it in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. God's method is always the same. So, it is obviously very germane to the whole argument at this point that the great apostle should be able to demonstrate this by an example and an illustration from Old Testament history. So he takes it up. Don't you know, he says, what the scripture saith of Elias? Now, a better translation there would be this. Don't you know what the scripture saith in Elias? That's actually what the apostle wrote. In Elias. Why do I make that point? Well, for this reason. That it, uh, it shows us uh, how the scripture refers to scripture. There is no book of Elias. So why does he say in Elias? Well, that's a way of saying... Don't you know uh, what God has said uh, in the portion of Scripture dealing with the story of Elias? And for short, he says, in Elias. You'll find that in other places that uh, the incident uh, is uh, used uh, as if it were descriptive or it was the designation of a particular book of the Scripture. It isn't that at all. Uh, what he says in Elias is what he says in the story, the record, the account that we have of Elias in 1 Kings, the first book of Kings, and in chapter 19. Then he goes on to tell us, of course, what this story of Elias is. He picks out the essential point. How he, Elias, maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now, we read the history in order that we might have the facts in our mind. Do you remember? It's a most remarkable story. 
How Elias had just been on Mount Carmel and there he'd been facing alone 850 false prophets. That was the position. On Mount Carmel he was standing alone and there were literally two groups of prophets. One of them were 400 and the other 450. 850 false prophets. And this one man stood against them like a lion. And of course he routed them and defeated them. But now, having done that, he hears about this proposal of Queen Jezebel to put him to, to death. And he escapes for his life. And there we see him sitting under the juniper tree. And we were reminded twice over, you remember in the record of what it was he said to God. I needn't weary you, needn't keep you in describing his feelings to you. But the important point, uh, according to the apostle, is that uh, Elias there made intercession to God against Israel. He made supplication to God against Israel. He virtually was praying to God to do something about these people and to destroy them. That's what it really means. He said, they've, they've broken your laws, they've killed your prophets, they've dug down their altars, and I alone am left, and they're now threatening to kill me. Why don't you do something about these people? Why don't you smite them? Why don't you strike them? He made supplication against them. He interceded against them. He called upon God, I say, to act in a judicial manner with respect to them. He not only runs away himself and sits down and speaks as he does and feels as he does, but he actually goes as far as that. Now then, what's the point? Well, the point is this, you see, and this is why the Apostle quotes it. The whole trouble at that point was that Elias misjudged the situation. Completely misjudged it. That's the whole illustration. What saith the answer of God unto him? Well, what it saith is, I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now then, the whole object of the apostle, of course, is to show the pattern. He says it isn't the case that uh, I alone uh, am saved and I'm a Christian. I am. I've quoted myself. I myself also am an Israelite. But uh, don't imagine for a moment, he says, that I'm in the position of Elias and thinking that I alone am left. It isn't the case at all. I am one of a great number. Uh, but there it is. God had to teach his great servant, uh, Elias, uh, that particular lesson. He says there's a curious parallel here. In the time of Elias, there was a real apostasy on behalf, on the part of the nation of Israel. A real apostasy. And if you looked at the situation superficially, you might very well have come to the conclusion that Elias was right. But the point is that Elias was absolutely wrong. And, says the apostle, it is exactly the same now. But we are not left again in the realm of opinion. He says, what set the answer of God unto him? Now, the apostle uses an interesting word here. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And there are those who would translate it like this. What set the oracle of God? It's a very special pronouncement by God. Or you might even translate it like this. What was the divine response to this intercession of Elias? You remember, there are other examples of this same kind of intercession in the um, New Testament, you remember uh, James and John, the uh, apostles, uh, asking our Lord if they should call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans because they wouldn't receive our Lord. It's, that's what's meant by this making intercession against them. But, you see, God answered his servant Elias. God responded to what he, he had asked of him by speaking to him and making a statement to him. And what he said to him was, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now, those who watched the reading carefully at the beginning will have noticed that the to myself is not there. And it isn't there. But Paul says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Why do I call attention to that? Well, uh, we've had to do this several times before. 
There are people who seem to get into trouble about a thing like that. They say, you know, here is the Apostle Paul claiming to quote uh, from the Old Testament, and yet he adds to myself. Where's your doctrine of inspiration of Scripture? That's why I'm calling attention to it. There are people, you see, who think that uh, that's a clever bit of argumentation. They don't like the idea of the inspiration, the inerrancy of Scripture, and this is the sort of argument that they bring forward. They say, what's the use of saying that this man was divinely inspired when he misquotes a scripture? Indeed, he adds to the scripture. How do you still hold to your doctrine of the divine inspiration of scripture? Well, as I've had occasion to point out many times, but as we get it again, I go on repeating it, lest you may have forgotten it or some of you may not even have heard what we have said hitherto. The answer is this. It is a proof of inspiration. It is the same Holy Spirit who inspired the writers in the Old Testament, who inspire the Apostle Paul. It is he alone who has a right to add or to change or to amplify or to give a different shade of meaning. The Apostle Paul, with his respect for scriptures as a Pharisee apart from anything else, leave alone as an apostle, would never venture to make any addition or subtraction or to quote in a manner which is not word perfect but he does so quite frequently, as we've seen, and the answer is that this is because he's inspired. And it here helps to bring out the very point that the apostle is anxious to make. God doesn't merely say, I have reserved, but I have reserved to myself. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. As the Spirit is the author and the inspirer, of the whole of Scripture. It is he alone who knows what particular meaning he wants to bring out at any particular point. So that far from being an argument against the divine inspiration, it is an argument in favor of it. Then we come, of course, to this question of statistics. And it, it is really important because it makes the thing stand out so clearly. Poor Elijah says, I am left alone. And God says to him in his oracle, I have 7,000. That's the contrast. One, 7,000, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now then, there is the exposition as such. Then, as I say, in verses 5 and 6, we come to the apostle's application of it. And this is why he has used it. Even so, in exactly the same way, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, in the time of Elijah, it was only a remnant that God had reserved unto himself. The bulk of the nation, as I've reminded you, had gone into a state of apostasy. But God had reserved a remnant. And what the Apostle is saying is that he has still, now, reserved a remnant. It looks, if you take a very superficial view of the situation, you might come to the conclusion that the Christian church consists only of Gentiles. It's wrong, says Paul. I mean it, but not only I, there are others. There is still a remnant, as there was in the days of Elias, there is still a remnant according to the election of grace. And I think it's important that we should bear this in mind that there were more Jews who had been converted and become Christians than we sometimes realize. For instance, let me read to you what you find in Acts uh, chapter 21 and verse 20. This is when the apostle was uh, speaking in... Uh, uh, where the apostle had arrived at Jerusalem. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the Lord. Now you notice that. How many thousands of Jews there are uh, which believe? So, what the Apostle is saying was strictly accurate. There was a remnant according to the election of grace. 
And there were large numbers of Jews who had believed. Therefore, this idea that God has finished with his people is something that is entirely wrong. It's wrong from every standpoint, but chiefly wrong purely on the factual level. But then you notice that he isn't content with just leaving it at that, as saying there is a remnant according to the election of grace he adds, if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And then there is a further statement to which I've just got to call attention because, uh, again, the commentators make a great deal of this. They point out that in the best and the oldest manuscripts, the second half of verse 6 is non-existent. Uh, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, it doesn't matter, of course, at all. Uh, I take it you're all clear that this isn't higher criticism, this is textual, textual criticism. There are many manuscripts, and some are more important than others. In the best manuscripts, the second half is not present. And, of course, it doesn't make any difference. It's simply the exact reverse of what he said in the first half. The first half really says it all. If it is by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace then it follows inevitably from that, that if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, the main point, the material point is, it's either got to be grace or works. It can't be the two at the same time. These are eternal antitheses, and if it's one, well then, it cannot be the other. Now, again, some of the commentators wonder why Paul even said the first half of verse 6. It's agreed that he did, and there's no trouble about that. The first part of verse 6 is in all the manuscripts. But some of the commentators wonder why the apostle said this. They can't see that it's uh, very material to the argument that he's developing. And I'm rather amazed at that because it does seem to me that it, it, this is very, very vital to his argument. Because he has said, you see, that it is a remnant according to the election of grace. Then he says, let's get this clear once more. If it is by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Now, it's very relevant. Some seem to feel that uh, the apostle brings it in because he was a preacher. And a preacher likes to repeat his points. He's been making a great deal of this works, grace, antithesis from the very beginning of the epistle. Indeed, the whole epistle is, in a sense, a treatise on this whole question that it's grace and not works. And they say, well, of course, there it is. That's one of the habits of you preachers. You drag it in, you stay, say it once more, and uh, you repeat yourselves, and so on. So, having said the election of grace, he can't resist it. He has to say, if grace, then it's no more works. Just another final knock with a hammer onto that nail to make sure that it really has got fixed there and it'll never be moved. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to grant that there may be some force in that argument, but it seems to me that there is something still more important here, something which makes it almost inevitable that he should say it. He's out, as I want to show you now, to demonstrate the absolute certainty of all this, that what is happening in Israel isn't out of hand, as it were, that God is in control. It's this great overarching doctrine of the election of grace, which we found him working out in such detail in chapter 9 that he is reminding us of once more. Very well. Now then, there's the pure exposition. Let's come to the application and to the lessons for ourselves. First of all, let us draw or learn a theological or a doctrinal lesson and a very important one. What's that? Well, it is this doctrine of the remnant. The remnant. Here it is. It was there in the time of the prophet Elijah. And the argument really is this. That the remnant, in a sense, gives us a kind of guarantee for the nation. The remnant is, after all, a part of the nation. And because a remnant is saved, you cannot say and must not say that the whole nation is rejected. Because the remnant is a part of a whole, the fact that the part is saved tells us something about the whole. Now, we mustn't press this too far. 
There are those who would say that the remnant, as it were, at this point, constitutes the whole. We mustn't say that, because that isn't the apostle's argument. He is saying there is a remnant of the whole that has been saved. And that was the position also in the time of Elias. But, and this, of course, is the really important point. It is God who preserves the remnant. Now, you see, this is put to us in several words. Reserve. I have reserved to myself. Then uh, he puts it in another word, in the word election. Even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to, as the result of, the election. And to make it still stronger, the election of grace. Now, you couldn't have anything stronger than this. He couldn't have chosen three words that could have brought out this point with greater force. I have reserved. I have elected. The principle in operation is one of grace. Here, again, is, of course, something that is quite fundamental to the whole of the biblical teaching. Here is something that uh, we ought to grapple with and we ought to understand. Now, let me give you some further evidence uh, concerning this before uh, I proceed to draw out the full theological and doctrinal conclusions. Take, for instance, what you read in the book of Isaiah in the first chapter and verse 9. Or take verse 8 with it before. The prophet is describing the condition of Israel. Here was another time, you see, of terrible apostasy. You remember the description. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. It's as bad as that. Then he adds this tremendous statement except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now, what he means is this. He says, if it were not that God had preserved for himself a very small remnant, and it's God who's done it, we would have been destroyed even as Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, he says the position of Israel would be entirely hopeless. Were it not for God's grace, God's own election, God's own determination to leave for us a very small remnant. Now there is exactly this same doctrine. And of course, it is in many ways the leading doctrine in the whole of the book of Isaiah. Now there's a very interesting further example of this in the seventh chapter of Isaiah and in the third verse. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou, and share Jashub thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. All I want to call attention to is the name of Isaiah's son. His son's name, and God had told him what to call him, the son's name is Shear Jashub. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is a remnant shall return. You remember how God uh, not only spoke directly through the prophets, he spoke in a pictorial and in a dramatic manner. You remember the case of Hosea having to marry that particular woman and names again given to his children, and the names that Isaiah was commanded of God to give to his children. And God was speaking through these very names that he ordered these men to give to their children. And the meaning of this very name, Shear Jashub, is a remnant shall return. So in that pictorial, dramatic manner, God was teaching through the prophet Isaiah this whole doctrine of the remnant. The children of Israel, because of their sin and apostasy, were to be carried away to the captivity of Babylon. That's the great pronouncement, the judgment of God upon the nation, the casting away, as it were, of the nation. But a remnant shall return. It's this great doctrine 
of the remnant. Now, when you come to the New Testament, you get exactly the same teaching taught by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy, as you remember, was always ready to be depressed. Timothy hears that the great apostle is in prison, that he's likely to be put to death at any moment. Timothy hears of men denying the truth, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of heard, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Poor Timothy could see everybody leaving the church and all the churches disappearing, and if the apostle died, that was going to be the end. He was always liable to draw these doleful conclusions and to indulge in his most pessimistic prognostications. But you remember how Paul answers him. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's 2 Timothy 2.19. Exactly the same point. Timothy says everybody's leaving. What's going to happen? Look here, says Paul, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. It's all right, he says. Everybody isn't leaving. And God knows what he's doing. And his foundation is sure and unshakable. In other words, it is the great message of God's plan and God's purpose. Were it not God's plan and God's purpose... Well, the children of Israel would have vanished long ago, even before the time of our Lord. Were it not for God's purpose, the Christian church would long since have disappeared altogether. There is only one reason why the church goes on, and that is because she is the church of God. If it were our church, we would long since have ruined her. But it isn't, you see. It's an election. The remnant is the result of God's choice, the election. There's no other explanation. It doesn't doesn't depend upon men at all. It isn't that a certain few have decided to hold on to the truth. No, they wouldn't. Nobody would hold on to it if God didn't hold on to them. You see, he's worked this out in such detail in chapter 9 that we really mustn't go through it again, tempted though I am to do so. Because to me it is one of the most inexplicable things that any Christian person should ever object to this doctrine of the election of God. My dear friends, you wouldn't be sitting in this chapel were it not for the election of God. There'd be no chapel. The Christian church would have perished centuries ago, probably in the first century. It is God who preserves the church, as he had preserved the children of Israel. You see, it's all there in chapter 9, verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. That's the answer to not as though the word of God had taken none effect. The word of God would have taken none effect were it not that God had kept it going. And he keeps it going by the principle of election. And election is entirely a matter of grace. Nobody's chosen because he's good. Nobody's chosen because he believes. If you take credit to yourself because you believe the gospel, you are denying the essential teaching of the New Testament. No, no, you don't believe because you're a better person than the unbeliever who's out in the world tonight. Not at all. We're all the same. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That any man is saved at all is solely due to the election of grace. And as he says, if it's of grace, well then it's no more of works. It's got to be one or the other. Grace means this, that we are saved in spite of ourselves. That it is altogether of God's goodness. Grace, by definition, means this. It means favor shown to people who don't deserve any favor at all. It is favor shown to criminals, to people who deserve to be destroyed everlastingly. Grace is entirely of God. It's not God's response to anything that we do. It is initiated by God. It all comes from God. Grace, and as he says... If by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. If you try to bring in yourself or anything you've done or said or thought, in any way, you are denying the doctrine of grace. 
Human works doesn't come in at all. And the point that is emphasized here is, of course, that the remnant is preserved solely because it is the purpose of God. If he had not left unto us a very small remnant, yes, and it was he alone who could leave it, all would have gone, but for him, let me give you the classical example of this if you like. What happened in Sodom and Gomorrah to which Isaiah refers, Noah and his family had gone there, as you know. They should never have gone there. That's where Noah made his great mistake. He chose the cities of the plain. He wanted to make money. He wanted to have a certain kind of life. And poor Abram's left farming a few sheep on top of the mountains. That was the initial mistake of Noah. And then things go from bad to worse. The terrible life that was lived in those cities of the plain. And God decides to destroy them. And he sends his angels, you remember, to warn Noah and his family. And there's a great statement there in that 19th chapter of Genesis, which I sometimes think is one of the most dramatic statements in the whole of the scripture. Here is Noah, and here's the messenger of God, and the statement is, while he lingered, while he lingered. If it had been left to Noah, he would have been destroyed, and his family, with the cities of the plain, with Sodom and Gomorrah. But the angel of God put his hand upon him and he led him out while he lingered. He was led out. He was saved by the action of God. The warning wasn't enough. He had literally to be pressed out as it were, to be led out. And so the remnant was saved out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so it was, says Isaiah, in, so it was in the time of Isaiah. And the apostle is saying here that it is still the same. It is God who keeps it going. It is the election of grace. And if it's grace, it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. It is all together of God. Now then, there's your doctrine. There's your theology. Shall we draw a few practical conclusions and deductions for ourselves out of all this? And I thank God for it. This passage makes me thank God for the scriptures more than ever. How wonderful the scriptures are. Not only the teaching, but even the history. I like the history in the scriptures. I like these examples and illustrations of the men of God and God's prophets and chosen servants. What a comfort it is to read about a man like Elias, Elijah. That he could ever be found sitting under a juniper tree. What a comfort to us lesser mortals who spend a lot of our time in such places. Look at this mighty man of God, this blazing prophet, the first of the great prophets of God in Israel, Elijah, the Mount Carmel men, the men of courage, the rock-like character who can defy the 850. I nearly said, thank God, that in this next chapter, 1 Kings 19, He's to be found sitting there under the tree feeling very sorry for himself and grumbling and complaining. Oh, the comfort and the consolation of the scriptures. But let me draw some detailed lessons. Here's the first lesson that I draw from all this. We must learn to face every situation in life in a scriptural manner. What I mean by that is this. Whatever happens to us, let's not merely look at the thing itself. Let's not merely apply our own reason to it. Let's think of it scripturally. Uh, if you like, I can put it like this. Say to yourself, well now, has anything similar to this happened in the scriptures? Can I find an analogy in the scriptures? That's what Paul was doing. He says, no, but what, don't you know what he not, what the scriptures saith of Elias, he says, look here, you shouldn't be in trouble about what's happening now. Can't you see? There's a perfect illustration of it there. Now, we must do this deliberately. Don't merely look at what's happening to you. Otherwise, you'll be under your juniper tree and all the rest of it. But now begin to think scripturally. So now then, where's the analogy for this? I must think of this in a scriptural manner and in a scriptural context. It would solve most of our problems. It would certainly deliver us from most of our depressions. Another practical, very personal lesson that I draw is this. Let's be careful that we never become involved too personally in these matters. 
What do I mean? Well, I don't mean that you should take a detached theoretical attitude to the things of God and the life and the work of the church. I don't mean that at all. That's all wrong, of course. In that sense, you must be personally involved. But what I do mean is this. Never let the devil persuade you that the church is yours. Don't get involved personally like that. That was the trouble with Elijah, wasn't it? You see, Israel was his. I alone am left and now they're trying to kill me. As if God were not there and as if Israel didn't belong to God. It was his concern. It was his institution, as it were. It was his nation. He'd got involved personally in the wrong sense. And so he becomes depressed. In other words, I've often said it from this pulpit. There is nothing more important for us to remember, especially at a time like this, than just this simple fact. The church isn't ours. The battle is not yours, but God's. This is one of the great troubles. People think of it in terms of themselves, as if the church were their possession, and they become involved personally, they become hurt, and they become offended, and so on. We mustn't become involved in that wrong sense. It isn't ours. It belongs to the everlasting and eternal God. All right, then let's, le let's uh, learn a warning here. There's a warning for us here, and a much needed one at the present time. Don't be carried away by numbers. Don't follow the crowd. In the time of Elijah, almost everybody was on the wrong side. All the prophets were, that was true. There were unknown people, the 7,000, but as for the prophets, they were all on the wrong side. But Elijah didn't say, well, I must be wrong if I can't be right alone and all those men wrong. That's what they're trying to get us to say today, you know. Ecumenical movement. Who are you to stand against this? I say, thank God for this story of Elijah. Doesn't matter if the whole world said the other thing. Don't follow the crowd. Don't assume that the numbers are always right. Remember, truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. It's as true tonight as it has ever been. You don't judge these matters by numbers. It's truth that matters. Uh, you stand out with the men like Elijah, Martin Luther, standing alone. Standing against 15 centuries of Roman Catholic tradition and teaching, with all the great doctors of the church arrayed against him, doesn't matter. He knows what's true. So he says, I can no other. So help me God. Very well, I think we need to learn this great lesson which comes out of this doctrine of the remnant at the present time. The whole atmosphere is against this at the present time. They don't like remnants. They're thinking in numbers, amalgamations, world church, and so on. And who are you to stand out? And so you will get vilified and criticized. Don't worry, my friends. Don't worry. Don't think in terms of numbers. It's truth that matters. Not numbers, not popularity, not any one of these things. There's a great warning to us here. And then there's a rebuke to us here. And the rebuke is, of course, that we mustn't become pessimistic. We must never feel a sense of despair. Still less must we become cynical. Well, it's all very well to say that, isn't it? And very easy to say that. But it's very difficult to put it into practice. We are living in days of great discouragement, and especially for evangelical people who value truth. The whole climate of opinion today is to the effect... Oh, what's it matter in the end? It's a man's general spirit that matters. What's it matter whether you know what you believe or not? The whole climate is against you. And, of course, then you're driven perhaps to pessimism, to despair. You see the whole cause going. You begin to say, I alone am left, and you sit down under your juniper tree, or you run away from it, and you say, well, let them get on with it. I've done my best. I can't do any more. Let them get on with it. If that's what they want, let them have it. They'll soon discover. They'll find it eventually. I can't do any more about it. Terrible temptation that comes sometimes. This utter discouragement when you've given yourself your soul, as it were, and you see the silly masses of people listening to the false prophets. The temptation is to turn away, to run away like Elijah did, and said, well, I can do no more for them. Let them stew in their own juice. And you sit under your juniper tree and you feel very sorry for yourself. But my friends, 
this incident rebukes us. When you sit there, God will come to you as he came to Elijah. And what he'll say to you is this. What are you doing here? This is not your place. This is no place for the Elijah of Mount Carmel. Elijahs don't run away from women, though they be queens. What are you doing here, Elijah? Get back to your place. Get back to your work. There's a rebuke here. And my friends, you and I need this in these difficult, trying, testing times through which we are passing. But let me end with the comfort. The comfort of this great incident. And the comfort of the great incident is this. God's purposes are sure. And that's why the apostle, you see, brings in this election remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. You see, this is the comfort, and that's why he makes the point. That's why the expositor shouldn't say, why does he bring this in here? The answer is this. He says, look here. Thank God this matter doesn't depend upon us at all. Not of works. It's all of the grace of God. God will keep his church going. The remnant may become a very small one. It doesn't matter. God's purposes are sure. Nothing can stop them. Nothing can frustrate them. It doesn't matter how many wander away and fall by the wayside. God will always have his remnant. God will always keep his work going. We don't know how, but he always will. That's the great doctrine. And he always has, of course. History is full of proofs of this. In the worst period of the darkness of Roman Catholicism, you had people like the Waldensians in northern Italy and the Brethren of the Common Life in Moravia and Bohemia and in parts of Holland and places like that. God has always had his remnant, always had a people, and he's kept it going, and he will keep it going. That is why we need not finally be troubled nor worried about all that is happening in the modern world. All this notion of a great world church, which won't leave very much room for the evangelical faith, my friends. You needn't worry. You needn't worry about God's cause. He'll keep it going. What's important for us is not to be worried about God's cause, not to take this wrong personal view of it, still less to be depressed or cast down or full of evil forebodings, or at the point of despair, or the tendency to cynicism. No, no. God will preserve his cause. He'll always have his people. And what you and I must make sure of is, is that we belong to them. So that when the day comes, we shall not have that awful feeling of shame that we just followed the crowd, took the easy way. We were ready to belong to a despised remnant however small. We were interested in nothing but in the truth. But let us remember this. That doesn't mean that you just sit down in an activity and saying we are the remnant and you don't care what happens to the rest. Not at all. That wasn't the apostle's attitude as we shall see as we go on through this chapter. He says he was doing his best to provoke the majority to jealousy. He didn't say, we're all right, come into my little circle, we are the orthodox, let the world go to hell, not at all. He was concerned about them. We've seen that at the beginning of chapter 9 and at the beginning of chapter 10. He'll repeat it. He's doing his best to create a jealousy within them that they may come back and believe the gospel. So you see, while you do take comfort from the doctrine of the remnant, you mustn't take the wrong comfort. Just saying, we are right, we alone are right, and we can do nothing. Not at all. It is our business to open the light of others, the, the, the eyes of others. It is our business to be concerned about them. The doctrine of the remnant, according to the election of grace, should preserve us from pessimism and despair, but it should never lead to inactivity and inaction. Being confident and sure of God's plan and purpose, we should exert our every effort to make the truth known and to persuade others to believe it and to accept it. Well, there, it seems to me, are some of the practical lessons that we can learn from this particular incident, this quotation about Elias, in addition to the great theological doctrinal truth on which it is all based. 
Thank God tonight that the church is the church of the living God and she will be preserved and she will do her work until the fullness of the Gentiles and all Israel are saved and the church of God will be complete and entire. But we are certain of that for one reason only. Not our works, so oh, if it depended upon us, it would be the most hopeless thing in the world. No, no. It is according to the election of grace. We are in the hands of God, the God who sees the end from the beginning. Thank God for the doctrine of the remnant according to the election of grace. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we do indeed offer our unworthy and humble praise for this great and glorious truth. O oh Lord, how can we thank thee sufficiently that thou hast ever looked upon us in spite of us, in spite of our works, in spite of all that is so true of us. We give unto thee and unto thee alone all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. We bless thy name this evening that we know that the foundation of God standeth sure that nothing can ever move it. That thou knowest them that are thine. Hear us, O Lord, and grant that we all may know thy seal upon us, that we may know of a surety that we belong to this blessed remnant according to the election of grace. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.